This is the Amp Hour Podcast, recorded June 16th, 2015, episode 254, with guest Andreas Olofsson, Abdaptiva's Amplitude Abacus. Welcome to the Amp Hour. I'm Dave Jones from the EEV blog. And I'm Chris Gamble of Contextual Electronics. And I'm Andreas Olofsson from Adaptiva. Hey, Andreas. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. And you're in Boston. Yes, just outside. Is that, Have you always been in Boston? Or is this just where you're uh, living and working now? No, I, ca- I came here in 2006. Um, uh, and but I've been, you know, I'm, I'm from Sweden originally, uh, and I've been on, you know, in and out of the U.S. since 1998. And and so, if people don't know, you are the founder of Adaptiva, and the, the name that people might know more in the home is uh, the Parallelo, which is a large, uh, well, not a large, just a small computer uh, that has large capabilities, basically doing parallel computing. So, can you tell us a little bit about? Uh, how all that all got started? Maybe the lead up to the the whole the whole project. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I, I started this company, Adaptiva, in two thousand eight, um, and uh, you know the the premise behind the company was that all of the computing uh, is going to be parallel someday. Um, and uh, I came to that conclusion while working at uh, Analog Devices for ten years, uh, working with some big honking iron DSPs, uh, one of them called Tiger Shark DSP. Yeah. And uh, it was it was it was a good processor, but uh, it was too big, too power inefficient. So it lost the battle to ASICs and FPGAs, mm-hmm. and uh, we ended up spending like a hundred million dollars. Um, right. And um, at it the was- end of the day, I was laid off, um, and then rehired to work on something else. But um, so the Tiger Shark was even less if power efficient than an FPGA. Oh yeah, yeah, not even. It wasn't even close. Really? Why? Yeah. Why was that? Was well. So I mean, FPGAs are are, are quite efficient if you customize your uh, your code to the problem. Right. Um, oh, of course. So, right. So so if you take something like uh, wireless communication, where the Tiger Shark was supposed to go, um, uh, if you want to look at forward error correction, like uh, Turbo with Turby, Reed Solomon, it's all bit twiddling and. Uh, the floating point performance of the Tiger Shark was useless for those things. So, ah, got it. Yeah, um, so there were some things that it was pretty good at, uh, but it was trying to do everything, you know, and the kitchen sink pretty much, right? It was <laughs> right. a video processor, a floating point processor, it ran an operating <laughs> system, and when you add all that up, it just is very inefficient. Um, and so, I, yeah, the FPGA was definitely winning. Um, ah, interesting. So, was this like a management uh, thing where they kept trying to pile on requirements for this <laughs> new Tiger Shark <laughs> processor? Or <laughs> can we go into that? <laughs> I, th- I think it's pretty common microprocessor uh, or chip design issue or disease. <laughs> disease, that, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. That, that you, you know, feature creep. You decide, you know what? Well, we need need this one feature, and and the problem is that. Every feature on its own looks great. Right. right. And you, and the architect or the manager will say, you know, this is going to win us a socket because it gives us 10x on this, you know, kernel. And then before you know, it, you have 100 of those feature features, each giving 10x on a certain kernel. But in aggregate, they destroy the whole product. Got it. Got it. So what was what would have been the comparison with, it, like, say, the Tiger Shark, for example, if you tried to duplicate the equivalent general purpose functionality inside an FPGA, the Tiger Shark would still be more efficient, wouldn't it? Because it's dedicated silicon. Yeah, yeah, oh, no doubt. Right? If you look at, I mean, that's that's an FPGA versus anything, right? Uh, if you take a, right. a a function like a um, a a Reed Solomon, right, or a turbo turbo decoder, right? Uh, mm. If you put that in FPGA. Versus making ASIC for that, you're probably talking about uh, 20x. Oh wow! Maybe. Oh okay, 20 mm-hmm. times. Wow. Yeah, maybe even more. So, uh, so ASIC they're always going to win. The problem is nobody can afford to to spin them. Right. Right, because it has to be so uh, perfectly formed to an application. If it's not a, a huge application, you'll never make your money back, right? Right. Exactly. Um, but it's it's a really 
really fascin fascinating optimization problem because if you uh, if you look at uh, where FPGAs are going today and where all the um, the application specific processors, it, it's kind of hitting the sweet spot be between programmability and flexibility and performance. Mm -hmm. So there are two opposite forces pulling it. Right. With, with regards to the ASIC side of things, um, do you, from your experience, do you see it getting worse and worse, like more expensive to spin custom ASICs, or is there anything out there that's looking promising in terms of people being able to spin ASICs relatively cheaply? Um, oh, yeah. I mean, I, I've, been, I've been writing about this for a while. In, in some sense, it's actually cheaper than ever to spin an ASIC. Really? Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Just Why like on a per, per logic gate kind of pricing basis or what? Yeah, well, per engineer basis, you know, when it when I started out in 1996, we we're still doing schematics and we were just uh -huh. starting with logic synthesis, so oh, synopsis really? tools and cadence wow. tools. Okay. And uh, um and so um and to make it go fast, we were doing a lot of silly stuff like custom design and dynamic logic uh, and uh, uh, transfer <laughs> gate based logic, you know, just <laughs> yeah, to, you know. Right. It was <laughs> So it was it was really slow, really really costly. Um, and, um, and today, if you take the right approach and you target a certain market, you you get free libraries from the foundry. So you know you don't have to design anything below metal. Basically, what you're doing is you're connecting transistors with uh, metal uh, metal wires. So my mm. design approach, for example, I never go lo go below the the first metal layer. So. When you um, when you design a, an ASIC, you you have, will have anywhere from five to nine metal layers to hook up the um, the gates with, mm. and, but the gate library somebody else did for you, and so it's actually you know quite simple. Yeah, it's just kind of like uh, like calling functions basically on a higher level program type thing, right? Exactly. I always right. I always program at a higher level abstraction. So I I'll write very low code. And um, then you know, push that in with it to a synopsis tool, uh, together with Tickle Script. Um, uh, and, yeah. Uh, Chip designers uh, love Tickle. I know that one. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, I, I can the flow I have for doing FPGA design or chip design is very similar. It's just uh, you know different Tickle Scripts, different tools, uh, a few more steps in chip design for sure. But um, you can uh, today. I mean, case in point, we did all of our chips uh, with less than three designers per chip. Oh, wow. Nice. Yep. Uh, and some of those chips, the, like the, the latest one we did at 28 nanometer, is 200 million transistors that we did in 12 weeks with three engineers. Holy um, crap. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> because wow. that's just right in top level code, right? Because, yeah, you don't have to worry, worry too much about the silicon level or even at all. Perhaps you don't have to worry about it. Uh, no, there's there's some tricks to it. You have to be very careful, and you have to have the right methodology um, and take a lot of margins. We're definitely not designing close to the edge, like somebody like Intel would do. Right. Um, you know, we're we're not pushing the envelope at all. But uh, if you, you stay that straight down the middle, um, and uh, you have experience in doing chips before, it's it's absolutely easier than ever. Hmm. So what do you so with the, your um, uh, with targeting either an FPGA or a or an ASIC? Um, what are the major differences there between targeting? Would you target an FPGA first to like actually trial your chip, or you wouldn't bother? You'd just shoot for silicon. No, we 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 um, we definitely prototyped everything in FPGAs first um, because it's. Uh, um, you can run things fast. You can actually validate with with complete test suites or, or right. kernel loads. Um, so it gives you the confidence of running enough clock cycles that it works. It's another synthesis tool. So sometimes the the tools will find and uncover different problems. Mm -hmm. um, they shouldn't, but sometimes they do. And uh, and I mean the FPGA, you you can you can spin that in a couple of hours or minutes, whereas the chip it takes you five or six months. And that's that's the killer right. for ASICs yep. really. It's not even the cost; it's the the time lost. So, when when you are uh, prototyping on FPGAs, then as well. So, does that mean that you also have those libraries from the foundries and such to actually push down to the FPGA, or is it like you have to customize that kind of stuff and do high level logic with there? That's 
No, we. I mean, we write we write our code in Verilog, um, you know, vanilla generic Verilog, and so it, it's really just a matter of, of feeding that into either a logical synthesis step to map to a an ASIC library or to map to the inside the FPGA. Cool. Yeah, that's that's good. Um, and and so like when you're targeting, so like I I don't actually know. So 200 million gates. I I really don't have any kind of measure on what that would actually be these days. Um, what does that what does that mean for if you have to like target a an FPGA that's a similar size or that could fit the same design in it? What what kind of size FPGA do you have to target to to match that same two hundred million gate thing? Um, I mean, it, it's a big one. It's an enormous one. I right? think of the one of the. I is mean, it so a single? Is it a single FPGA? Or is it one of those huge big boards with like twenty FPGAs on them that are designed for ASIC? prototyping no we couldn't afford one of those remember we're 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 (laughs) because they're very how how expensive are they um i i you know i I knew that i wasn't rich enough to ask uh, (laughs) so i didn't but i i can imagine them being you know a hundred thousand dollar range or something like that oh yeah wowza yeah because because (laughs) each fpga on there is like five thousand dollars right yeah if you have Mm, to ask you can't afford it (laughs) yeah So, 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 could you fit everything on the one FPGA, or would you just do? Oh, well, let's just do a little block we've got. So, yeah. So the um, uh, because our, our our design is very tiled, it's very encapsulated. We felt that you know taking a couple of tiles would be enough. So we actually took right. a, a mod uh, a modest sized FPGA and uh, and pushed some tiles in there. I think we are, we're up to four at maximum inside the tile, and we had a sixteen core mm-hmm. chip being taken. So, um, and, and it was, yeah, it wasn't perfect. It did flush out almost all the bugs. Right. Okay. But did you end up, did you get first spin on your ASIC silicon? Did, did you get it first go or did you have to go, oops, we forgot something and re-spin it? <laughs> Bodge wire. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so we have, we've had four versions of the chip. Um, the first one was something I did out of my basement and definitely a prototype. Uh, the first one was to really just to get enough money so I can get a team together. Um, so that I wouldn't, I would call that an, an intentional uh, punt, right? Prototype. Um, that was that was right. version zero, and then version one uh, was uh, was supposed to be a product, but uh, one of our vendors made a mistake, and so we had to spin it. But the you know it it happens, right? You, you're only as strong as your weakest link, and in this case, it was our partner. Um, and so we got, you know, we got retribution for that. Um, I was going to say, did the partner say, pick up the bill? Did they have to pay for it? Right. <laughs> right. They, yeah, yeah, they you did. They did. They did. Ouch. Um, so is 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 a goof up like that common? Is that something that you know the vendor factors into their, you know, oh look, we're going to screw up one out of every ten times, and it's going to cost us. Um, I think most people expect uh, some kind of spin. Um, but uh, it depends on how you how you schedule it and if you can work around it. Um, pretty catastrophic. Um, so um, yeah, it, you, 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 it's hard to afford those kinds of things when the margins are are pretty slim. Um, so yeah, I would I wouldn't say they build the pricing or anything. This was pretty unusual. Uh, I don't I don't want to go into it too much, but. Uh, Got it. Uh, but but um, so yeah, so that 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 first one, you know, Rev, I call it Rev One did not make into production, but Rev2 did. And the Rev2 is the one that now is, you know, is shipped to tens of thousands of, of parallel boards. So there was just kind of really one mess up there. And this is, so this is the one you ship f- for the Kickstarter project. That's right. Yeah. Could you tell us some more about the actual, uh, the architecture? Cause it's so, so you told us before the show started that this is, so this is a completely new architecture. And you said that the, one of the, the, the thinkings behind it was that, not necessarily going to be able to compete in with ARM in the marketplace for like a consumer level, but from a massively parallel level, you will. So, could you tell us like how how it's different than some of the architectures that people might already know? Yeah. So it's um. So the the idea was that the, uh, besides being parallel, the, the the future of computing is really heterogeneous, meaning that um, there's no one tool that will solve all problems, um, and that you you really have to have three tools in your toolbox. Uh, and one being a microprocessor that runs the, the operating system, the, the general purpose cleanup. Uh, and, uh, you know, x86 and ARM is fantastic at that. 
It's it's mm -hmm. a you know extremely uh, well positioned machine. Um, but if you're talking about high performance math, all that baggage that's in the the processor architecture, I mean the same baggage that I found in the Tiger Shark, it's there, which means that you're never really going to reach the top level performance that you need for certain applications. So you need something else that's more specialized. Right. So what sort of functionality would you put inside? Well, what functionality did you put inside your um, core, which is called the Epiphany? Is that correct? Yeah. 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 And what sort of functionality did you put inside that to go, right, this is going to be highly optimized and also kind of universal enough so that it's good enough for a lot of different applications. Is it, is it you know, floating point matrix stuff? What sort of, you know, functionality is in there? So um, first thing, we threw out everything. That, that, was, that was the major <laughs> realization. <laughs> that, that <laughs> throw out everything and then take, take pieces in one at a time. Um, and and so th basically things have been accumulating since the the day one of, of processor architectures and some of the things that were put in in the 1980s are not necessarily relevant today. Um, like what? Uh, so uh, you know, take uh, take for example the the cost equation for how much does uh, an instruction cost versus how much does a a data data movement cost, or on mm -hmm. the compiler side. Is it good to have a few registers or a lot of registers? Um, and uh, you know what kind of optimizations, especially what kind of optimizations, can be do, done in the compiler? Um, and so, um, so you know, I looked at at, at all the RISC architectures, um, and, you know, including ARM and MIPS um, and uh, the PowerPC, the Spark, some of the DSP stuff, and um, I realized that you know the majority of the instructions aren't needed. And certainly not needed right. if you want to do a math call processor. Um, and uh, in, a, in a way, it's kind of retro going back to the, where the DSP, the, the digital signal processor came from in the 1980s. It started out as a, as a multiply accumulate unit. And then yep. they tried to make that a little bit programmable. So they started bolting on feature after feature. And before you knew it, when they ended with the Tiger Shark, it was a you know, full-blown <laughs> microprocessor <laughs> built around a multiply accumulate grown up in right. the weirdest way um so so now we go back and say let's that's see. funny to visualize i'm sorry it's just you know yeah. like this multi-armed beast you yeah know? right yeah the hydra <laughs> of the of the computing world right <laughs> <laughs> oh, i love it so uh, so this is basically just a math co-processor that's it yes it's not really useful for general purpose computing as such that's right and and what sort of stuff works best on it? Is it is it matrix math? Is it you know what from a math point of view? So um, since it's a coprocessor, uh, mostly uh, it um, you generally want you you want a problem that is compute intensive. Um, so you're looking at a class of problems like uh, matrix multiplication, linear algebra, filters, convolutions. Things that are you know n squared or n cubed in complexity, right? Uh, because if they're not, if they're if they're if they're um, data limited, then you're always going to be I/O limited, and there's really no purpose mm. for this math coprocessor. So there has to be something extremely compute intensive, um, and 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 so that that's that's where we're coming from, um, and there's no. So that's a lot of like telecom stuff like that. Uh, yeah. So I mean, so. Um, Wireless communication is is a prime example. That's really where I came from, um, mm. and um, that was a great fit. Um, imaging applications, another great application area, mm -hmm. uh, whether it be medical imaging or video analysis or the kind of machine vision that's getting really popular today. What about uh, com compression and Bitcoin mining and all that sort of jazz? Um, so we try to stay away from things that were um, standards based, um, because um, in a lot of application areas, those become ASICs. Got it. Yep. Uh, and this is why right. this is why I really like the the imaging space is because there are there are there are no standards, right? Mm -hmm. There's no limit to how innovative scientists and comp computer programs can be on the on the computer vision side. Um, versus, let's say, an H.264 is a solved problem. 
right? People, mm-hmm. people banging into a, a little IP block or an ASIC, and it's gonna not going to be faster than that. Now, now sometimes it is an advantage to have programmability because you can do multi-standards, and if the standard is evolving, but that's that's kind of a second order concern. Right now, now you mentioned the data, yeah, like it's it's sort of computational intensive stuff instead of data intensive stuff but ultimately you've got to have like some data in there so like what's like the size of your onboard i'm, I'm sorry but you know both chris and i are like you know cpu architecture dummies here so we're big time <laughs> probably going to speak, <laughs> yeah so we're going to probably make fools of ourselves here but what is sort of like the on kip on chip cache or the on core cache memory how much data can it actually you know process without having to go to external memory if you know what i mean yeah, so we so we have um, on the on the on the chip that we ship with the um, with parallel, we have a half a megabyte of on chip SRAM. Is that general purpose, or is that like is that spread across each core? Yeah, that's spread out into a number of banks. So there is uh, actually right. sixty four banks. So it, there, you know that that uh, half a megabyte is split into sixty four eight kilobyte banks. Okay, so each core because you have got sixty four cores, each core has its own dedicated bank, does it? Uh, yeah, now I was actually referring to the 16-core chip now. So, but each each oh, okay. core right. has uh, four banks, so there's 64 banks in total. Got it. And the you know which is you know so lots of small banks, but each bank with an enormous amount of bandwidth. So because all those 64 banks can now be accessed simultaneously. Oh, n- <laughs> nasty. Okay. <laughs> so so it's it's you know it's it's the it's the curse and the power that you have in an FPGA as well. In FPGA, you have all these block ramps, and if you design your yep. your system correctly, that thing will fly. And if if you you know, but it takes a lot of love and care to get it to work like that. So with these, uh, you know, supercomputer multi-core processor chips, it's all about um, the flops per watt, right? Or gigaflops per watt, is it not? And is that where yours currently leads? Is world Leading is that right? At fifty gig flops per watt, or have you done actually? Have you ever got a new one that's actually more powerful than that now? No, so yeah, definitely the gigaflops per watt is is the metric. Uh, it's just you know you have to be very careful how you count it. Uh, and so, uh, <laughs> right? Are you are you counting at the <laughs> at the core level, at the chip level, at the system level? Uh, are you counting for an application or some? Data sheet number and so forth. Right. It's so hard to compare, um, and uh, that's why you always have to take it with a grain of salt. But um, um, I think the true number that you can always look at is how many square millimeters of silicon are people using. That one is really hard right. to cheat. And uh, you got it. <laughs> because I, I I'm looking at a table here where yours is twice the gig flops per watt of say an Nvidia. Uh, you know, GT six hundred and thirty processor or something like that, yep. like a you know video processor. Is that right? Because they're they're like huge dies, aren't they? They're massive bits of silicon. Yeah, so then they have more performance, but they have uh, more power as well, for sure. And right. uh, um, it's um, I mean it, it's a it's a tight race for sure. And and the key, the key but is is that something you're deliberately targeting. Is the uh, like is the per watt thing the smallest thing per watt? Yeah, that's the metric. That, that's not that's not necessarily even targeting. That's a, um, a byproduct of the architecture. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so the the idea is that anything that runs off a battery or wants to be small, energy efficiency is the only thing that matters going forward. And is yours well placed in that respect? Who are your major competitors in that? field in terms of you know energy efficiency so um it's um it, it's it's kind of everybody it, it, it's um fpgas can be very energy efficient mm-hmm. gpus can be very energy efficient um arm certainly has been um been pushing their energy efficiency versus other processors uh, in the right. data center space, but they they're dominating the smartphone space, and they they got there by being the most efficient. Um, on the wireless communication side, all the base stations have their own ASICs, so there mm-hmm. we uh, we compete with ASICs as well. So it's 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 every, it's an all out war with everyone everyone versus everyone. 
<laughs> right. Right. Yep. So, so what is what is your ultimate business model? Is it to be like Arm and actually sell your co- and and actually sorry license your core out? Is that the goal, or do you want to make chips? What do you want to do? So um, we, uh, yeah, we're definitely open for licensing, uh, and and that has been our business model. And but what we found was that it's very hard to do the licensing of a processor architecture without having the software to go with it. You can license the solution. As in the software, as in the compiler? Uh, no, that that we have. Uh, I mean the whole application stack. Right. Oh, the application space, of course. Nobody wants it. It's a chicken and egg thing. Nobody wants to use, no manufacturer wants to use your processor if there's no software, if there's no apps for it. Right, and, they, and nobody's going to build software for a processor that doesn't sell a billion smartphones. <laughs> right, yeah, money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, and it's, uh, it's almost like how, how you were saying that, you know, you, you guys take advantage of the software coming from the foundries. That's kind of what people are also looking for in order to shorten their development cycles so that they can have a three-person team and yep. develop some, you know, consumer-level product or some other type of product there. Yeah, that's right. Huh. What is what is the difference between, uh, well, uh, the sort of efficiency is probably not the right word, but you'll understand in a second, between actually uh, doing a supercomputer with separate chips, or, you know, be they 64 cores each, and then ha- or between the cores on the chip itself, is it better to go for a larger and larger silicon and have more and more cores on there, or is it better to have... Or is it more efficient, cheaper, whatever, to have multiple chips with only a smaller number of cores? What's the trade-off there? It depends on the architecture. In our case, definitely the bigger we can make the chips, the more we gain. We get kind of like a super linear speed up because um, if we put lots of small chips on the board, we're going to be I.O. limited because the, you know, the, you, let's say you have a BGA with a one millimeter pitch. There are only so many traces you can fit on that board um, on the uh, inside the chip. A, um, a wire might be, you know, 0.1 microns. So it's tiny. You can fit thousands of wires. So, so what's, what's the current limit to what size you can make your die? I mean, like you can't make it the size of a 300 millimeter wafer because it, there's a, a thing where it gets like yield versus, you know, cost and all that sort of thing, isn't it? Yeah, so the, 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 the max die size has stayed pretty constant for forever pretty much. Um, and it, it's kind of tightly related mm-hmm. to process scaling and Moore's law in that you, you go to the next process node right. when it's mature enough. Um, and um, mm-hmm. um, so we, we talk. And, and what is that size? What is that size limit? Uh, let's say around five to 600 square millimeters. So like 25 by 25. Right. So, uh, so if you can, if you can, um, um, by, by maximizing the size of the die, you can fit more memory on the die. Uh, which means that you can solve a bigger problem. And if you have a problem that scales as uh, n squared or n cubed, you've gained, right? Because that means that you, 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 mm-hmm. your, Got your gap between bringing data in and out versus computing grows. I see. Mm-hmm. And what, what, are, what is an example of a problem that would scale like that? I mean, again, I've, I, I'm going to show my naivety here. I, I don't know what people would push to a, a cluster of supercomputers like this. I mean, what, what, would, what would scale like that? square or cube like that what you said um so i mean one one classic one is let's say you're doing some image processing on a on a video stream um if you can fit the whole frame and maybe or maybe a frame and reference frame on the silicon die you can crunch your wave on that for a pretty long time without ever having to go off chip Uh ah but um if you Let's say you could only fit a fraction of that on chip, then you're going to be constantly shuffling, te- tem- uh, shuffling temporary uh, results on and off chip. I got you. Right. And then reconstructing and all the other stuff that goes along, all the other overhead that goes along with that then, right? Yeah. So all, the, all that temporary data you're going to have to put in DRAM somewhere mm-hmm. and uh, you're going to end up with you know, multiples of the, uh, of the bandwidth that you need for the actual uh, video frame in and out. Hmm. Does that mean, like, is video sort of like the killer... Uh, app for parallel processing. It seems to be uh, because, you know, we go into like 4K resolution stuff, you know, crazy resolution, crazy color depth, you know, like absolutely phenomenal 
stuff. So and and you want a processor that you know sixty frames per second these days and all that sort of stuff. Is that the killer app you're looking for? Hopefully that might um, sell your core. Unfortunately, not because the, uh, the you know the the TVs are all going to be standard. So you know, four K resolution is is and just they're going to and pixels hence, on a screen. Once a standard comes along, they spin an ASIC for it. That's right. Right. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, there 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 are, there are plenty of examples of, of super um, uh, challenging applications that can't be solved today. Uh, you know, I, the one that I one of the ones that I like the the most are uh, if you look at all the drones today that are mm. really taking off. Um, we know that there's no nobody today that can do uh, autonomous navigation and autonomous obstacle avoidance yes. in properly. And the reason for that is there's just nearly not nearly enough processing power. On you have, let's say, a 50 gram payload or something, maybe 100 mm. grams, and uh, you might be able to do it if you had a big honking Intel processor sitting in, a, in your <laughs> yeah, of laptop. Of course, but that's <laughs> taking you know 100 watts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't do it with a with a little tiny processor there right now. So to me, that that's an example of, um, in order to fly fast with a drone, you might be flying 20, 30 miles an hour. Mm-hmm. And you know what? If you want to fly through trees, um, yep. oh yeah, uh, you don't want to hit any trees. You need to make those decisions in milliseconds. That's that's a tough problem. Yeah, hmm. right, right. Because it's not just bringing in the frames and and crunching on them. It's also processing on them and doing all of the detection and the and then reacting and all that other stuff. Yeah, you have to filter. You have to detect objects. You have to make sense of the objects. It's a very very tough hmm. problem. Yeah. So how do people? Okay, so. People can obviously buy this. this. is a very, very affordable. It's a, I'm amazed at how accessible this is. Actually, um, I was mentioning before the show as well. Just even having like a zinc on board, that's amazingly accessible as well for the price. Um, but if someone did get this, where do they normally start? Is it like start with uh, like some kind of Python programming on like the like a higher le- like an OS running on the ARM processor, or is it? Uh, what, what's it normally running? What, what can what can you really do when you're for someone that's getting started with it? So um, you, the people who get started, will 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 start with you know reading through the manuals, look at our SDK, and and think all right how do I how do I make use of this thing? How do I send out? They think of each processor as its own core, um, and uh, and then you'd start on the ARM. You have some problem, the application code that you want to work on. And um, then you take some part of that application that's a bottleneck. You'll send out. You, you'll divide that up into sixteen work threads. You'll send each thread to a to an Epiphany core, and there's your you know your initial speed up. And if you're lucky enough, you don't have any communication between the threads. Ah, uh, okay, um, right. If you if you do have communication between the threads, things all of a sudden got a lot more complicated. But that's no different from any other parallel programming problem. Well, it is a, it is a little more bare metal here, so it's going to be harder uh, with with this architecture until now. Okay, but it's um, it, it's kind of a general problem. So, what I found is that the, the people who really done well here are people who come in with all the experience in parallel programming already, and they just right. kind of have to yeah. frame you know uh, adopt that experience to the Epiphany platform. Um, the 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 people who have struggled more have been people who don't have the parallel programming experience. And this is their first, you know, kind of first try. That's been that's been rough. Oh, people that are used to just a micro and and basically like sequential programming, just kind of chunking through a task, that kind of idea. Yeah. Have you got any real good uh, examples of uh, acceleration where people have actually used it in a real application? What sort of performance increase they got by actually shuffling it off the ARM processor and onto the uh, core? Yeah, and we, we have, we've done our own with things, uh, single processing kernels like matrix multiplication, FFTs. Uh, mm-hmm. Some other people have done it with um, various um, compute-intensive applications like uh, password cracking, for example. Right, yes. Uh, one, one student um, uh, sponsored by uh, these guys in Russia who have a, a very well-known um, package called Bcrypt. Uh, they, they did a project for Google Summer of Code and... They got amazing speed ups. Um, Have and, you got uh, a number? Can you throw a number at us? Twenty five x. Right. <laughs> yeah, that'll that'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's nuts. 
So can people actually buy your the chip on its own, or or do they have to buy the development board? Um, it's it's open for buying. It's not in production yet. It's sampling. Okay. Um, right. And so uh, right now, people have to reach out reach out to us. We're 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 trying to get into uh, DigiKey and RS components channels. Um, yep. And uh, but it, yeah, it's certainly available. We got uh, tens of thousands of them built up, waiting to uh, waiting to be shipped. Excellent. Can you can you tell us about your your Kickstarter campaign? Because this was what three was it three years ago? Almost yeah, two, quite uh, a, fall two thousand twelve. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Can you tell us about uh, that? Did you ship on time? Did you have any major issues? What happened? Did it all fall apart? Did you end up losing money and go, oh, never again? Uh, um, so, yeah, I think we all know the answer to that one. Um, yeah, well, tell us. We, we, we love to hear these horror stories. Come on. No, not horror stories. <laughs> Opportunities for learning. That's what it is. It's, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We're living vicariously through others. <laughs> So, um, so we, you know, two th- summer two thousand twelve. I just come off a, um, a bunch of trips to uh, you know all over to try to license our architecture uh, to the smartphone manufacturers, and uh, it, you know without software application, it wasn't going to happen. Um, mm-hmm. So, and around that time too, uh, Raspberry Pi had just launched and been hugely successful, um, and uh, mm-hmm. there was also the um, the Ouya gaming platform and Pebble. I mean, Kickstarter was was right. hot, and I thought, "Wow, yeah, this, yeah. this is fantastic!" Yeah, yeah. I mean, these people <laughs> here's a here's are these um, consumer applications, and they sell ten million. Uh, I thought, if we if we have the you know the best processor born you know on the planet, we'll sell more than that. <laughs> that was my yeah, right. <laughs> that was my I, I incredibly naive thought, and, and so I decided you know, that we should launch, um, and um, uh, we did. But I mean, we. We made all kinds of mistakes. Um, it wasn't it wasn't nearly polished as some, as some of the other platforms. So our, um, our 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 marketing kind of failed. The I did not understand that Kickstarter really is about a a, a finished device that consumers can use. It's not about selling platforms, right? right? It's not for developers and programmers. Mm-hmm. The size of the developer market is a tiny, tiny fraction of the size of the consumer market. The, the funny thing is, though, that's what Kickstarter is really for. It's for building businesses and, and up from that sort of ground up. You know, it's not to sell a polished, finished product. Well, that was never its intention anyway. Um, and so, yeah, so, so the, the, the effect was that the market wasn't nearly as big as I thought it was. Uh, and we, I think we raised like $100,000 on the first day, uh, which is great, but it's not nearly enough to build a chip on or to get a chip into production and build a board um, and sell it for $99. So, um, so we, we knew we were kind of in, in trouble, but uh, we, uh, we really wanted this to work. And so we worked hard for 30 days, uh, kept working on material, disclosing more information. We opened our data sheets and reference manuals and, uh, and, and worked, worked very hard. So I think we, we did that right. But uh, after 30 days... And you managed to get your goal. Your goal was 750000 and you got nine, almost 900 Yeah, yeah. I mean, t- towards the end there, it um, uh, we released a new video, right, that was less academic, more consumer-oriented, where we, we showed off, right. you know, the, the prototype system, Z-Board. <laughs> uh, or no, it wasn't even Z-Board. I think it was a Zinc 706. We had, we had both that we were playing with. And, uh, and an FMC with our chip on it. I mean, this was a... A, you know, a complete prototype. Uh, and so we, we showed what we had and we showed, told everybody where we wanted to get to. Um, but even now looking back, that, you know, those are some pretty pretty lofty goals. Say, you know, here you have right. an eval kit that costs $1,000 and that's, you know, like a, um, a, a regular sheet paper, right? Um, a, um, and then we're going to take that, all that electronics and turn it into a credit card and, and get the price down by a factor of 10 to $99. It was, it was very aggressive. Mm. Um, and did so, you ultimately do it though? Yeah, we did. Excellent. Um, Sounds like it worked. We, we did. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so you actually so we, raised enough money to just enough money to do it in the end or? No, we didn't raise nearly enough money, but we did it anyway. <laughs> right, right, um, okay. <laughs> so, so we in the end, I mean, the the um, 
on the on the business side, I made a lot of mistakes uh, in you know pricing it too low. Um, right. So yep. it, you know, it, on its own, it didn't become a viable business. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't think we're the only ones from Kickstarter campaigns to do that. In no, fact, I think the yep. the more money you raise on Kickstarter with a lower price, the more trouble you get yourself into. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, and so for us, you know, if if we would have set the price at two hundred dollars, there's no way we would have met our goal. Right. That, right. At least that's my. You think you my, think my psychologically, feeling. people people wouldn't have bought it. You think that ninety nine dollar goal, that ninety nine dollar price, was a psychological thing where people you get oh yeah it's only 99 bucks i'll here's my credit card i, I yeah i th- i still think that's you know the the price has a lot to do with it and he, i mean look at the success of the the new computer the chip computer the nine dollar one mean, yeah exactly because it's nine dollars nine dollars right care. i mean the pro- yeah <laughs> right i i think that the magical market now is not 25 it's 25 dollars uh, 99 dollars 25 dollars right that you right. need to be below 25 to really reach the consumers um, yep. In, in to be <laughs> an impulse buy, which is so nuts. But but but, <laughs> but you weren't targeting consumers, though, were were you? Or was that your intention to sort of get one into every home, like the Raspberry Pi kind of, you know, thing? Oh, the whole world needs to learn. Every grandmother needs to learn about supercomputer programming. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, we were we were um, targeting hackers and developers, but you know, really targeting mm-hmm. people new at a program. Right. And 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 I. Th- yeah, I you know thought there would be m- more people like that. I mean, there's mm-hmm. probably 20 million programmers, so that was our market. Yep. Uh, but um, it's uh, so we got let's say 5,000, um, mm-hmm. and um, it's um, I mean it's a pretty good number, but it, it's not it's not quite enough. Right. Yeah, I, I think uh, that was a realistic number. I mean, you know, to get 5,000 backers, for example, that's a lot in the in you know for a product like this i think so so i, th- I think you did really well to actually get that many <laughs> yeah no i think so I mean, in retrospect we, we we did great um it just the, the sad part is that it's it mm. still wasn't enough <laughs> right <laughs> um and so uh, so we we started you know we started building and in in the beginning things were going well uh, um, in, in, you know, I think the, the major obstacle was that the, the $99 price point we set when we started the campaign, and since we didn't have a board build out yet, we could have no way of knowing what the pricing would be for the chips and the components on the board. Mm-hmm. So, so we didn't have anything pre-negotiated with any of the vendors on the board. Oh, uh, in fact, it. we didn't uh, even yeah. have all the components picked out yet. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It'll look something um, like the, uh, the Zinc development board, but... Cheaper. Yeah, right. Exa- exactly. <laughs> yeah, whatever it needs to do, cheaper. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so when we started negotiating pricing, it, it was it was hard. I mean, uh, it was um, you know, nobody's going to give their stuff away for free. So it was a lot of convincing that this was going to be a, a you know very big effort and, and open source. Open source helped a huge amount because mm-hmm. it became mm-hmm. a, a kind of reference design for a lot of these chips on the board. Oh right, right. Uh, yeah. So that really helped. Dri- that really helped drive the the, the prices down, um, and um, you know, Raspberry Pi certainly helped. We we, we were going to be the next Raspberry Pi, um, and uh, so that helped convince people that they needed to give us the pricing that that could, that could get, God, could get right. us ninety nine dollars. <laughs> Got it. Um, and, and you're currently selling it on DigiKey for. Depends on the type. You currently sell it for 126 to 264. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So we have. I mean, those are distributed pricing. Um, we have our official list pricing on um, on Amazon. So we have a uh, 99, 149, and 249. Right. So so you ultimately in after three years you ultimately can sell it for 99 dollars and make a viable business out of that. Or is it still sort of oh we're sort of you know selling it at cost kind of thing or at a loss to? No, we're making money you know. on every board, uh, gross okay. profit. Um, but uh, I think the and I, I I you know I I think this is pretty common for for pe- or, you know the hundreds of people who uh, who build single board computers is unless you get to a hundred thousand boards or above um, and or working out of your basement in your free time, hmm. you can't make a living. Yeah, right. yeah, right, of um, course. Be- because because you know, an, an engineer in the U.S., um, you know, if if you're not making a hundred thousand dollars somewhere, mm. you, 
might be you probably underpaid, right? So right. you have to figure you, your cost is a hundred thousand dollars, and so um, that's for one engineer. So if we sell oh, yeah. ten thousand boards, which we have, and we're making ten dollars per board, we just made a hundred thousand dollars in profit. Um, that pays for less than one engineer with healthcare and everything else. Yeah, I was gonna say usually <laughs> I put it, I pick it at two hundred k for overhead and everything else. That's usually a yeah. a safe bet. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. That's, right. and that, that's yeah. yeah. And and it's like that nine dollar chip computer. I was reading, uh, you know, article. Who was it? Oh, we talked about it last yeah, week. We did. Where, Olamax, that, yeah, we did. Where they can't po- Yeah, they can't possibly make that a viable business. They can't. It's just not possible or right, something but it like almost that. becomes like a like all of this almost is like a marketing platform for the for the chip on board right, right? for them it's yeah. they're obviously they don't they're not running the 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 chip that's an all win or whatever all winner uh but for your stuff it's you know this is this is actually i think brilliant marketing for for the for the epiphany and for and and like you said for for the zinc and other things you know where it's accessible and mm-hmm. if there's a community around it much like beagle bone and uh, not like anyone's going to be able to get a Broadcom chip, but you know the Raspberry Pi as well. There's communities around it, mm-hmm. and that that is a net positive for the platform. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. It, w- would your holy grail be to get one of these in every smartphone? Because smartphone is the consumer platform of choice, right? It's you know, it's just what everyone has in their pocket. Would 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 that be of? Is that a goal that's even possible to get the manufacturers to go, well, let's, you know, we don't know yet, but let's stick this chip in here and, you know, and the capabilities there for running all this energy efficient, you know, parallel processing in a phone. Because phones are doing some very heavy duty processing these days and it's, you know, becoming a big uh, uh, problem to get, you know, um, to get performance while maximizing the life of the battery. Um, yeah, uh, and so I, I think the, the phone, uh, the biggest platform, the most prolific, uh, prevalent platform is going to win because that's where all the money is. Um, and so it used to be the PC, now it's the phone. And in the future, it if you follow Bell's law, it might be something even smaller. So, you know, maybe it's uh, a watch or maybe some other wearable device. Right, but then I/O becomes the issue. You know, it's the user interface and all that sort of jazz. Yeah, yeah. But is it possible to sort of get one of these? <laughs> is it possible to convince one of the manufacturers to put one of these in your, you know, like a maybe a high-end phone, and it's a marketing thing? Woohoo! Look, it's got a parallel computer in it. You know, but if there's no apps to utilize it, then I guess yeah, the answer have, is no, to, right? You have to come with a solution. Um, and uh, and so our the approach was if we keep working with uh, universities and 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 the community and everybody else, eventually we'll we'll lock on to one of these killer applications, and, mm-hmm. and then we'll work with people to create the um, create the whole solution that then could go into a smartphone. So I'm curious about you know speaking of solutions and stuff like that uh, and 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 the universities. So on the software level, and and you know you mentioned kind of getting started on the ARM side, but what are people? Are, I mean, how much is the flexible part of the Zinc, which is like a FPGA core around it? How much is that getting used? And then how much? Like, what is, what is the breakout like uh, as you dive down through through abstraction layers to the kind of to the bare metal? Where do you, where do where do people go after just the ARM core? You'd mentioned the breakup on the the Epiphany, but yeah. So so the um, there's. There's definitely um, a smaller community that uses the FPGA logic, but it, it's completely accessible. You, you know, you download the free web tools from Xilinx, and you, you burn a, a bitstream, you put that on the SD card, and you have your own custom FPGA logic. So we've seen a few people blogging about it and, and trying ideas. Uh, the guys doing the um, that password cracking one, they actually ran it on the Zinc as well as on the Epiphany, and the zinc was actually the the winner over the epiphany even so so really? in terms of Why ranking was fpga was number 1 epiphany uh, cuz it was uh, you know uh, it's all bit level shuffling stuff right 
Um, it's uh, it's doing a bunch of XORs on and on uh, um, and and you don't need 32-bit math for it. Right. So it's not really yeah. It's not it's not really math, right? It's not matrix operations right. and all that sort of jazz. So so they they, they did a whole uh, a whole write up on it and a whole design uh, which is you know open sourced and, and up on our Git repo. Um, and uh, but I, I would say that the majority of people use the ARM because that's the easiest, and then they use the Epiphany, and then third, some of the people use the FPGA as well. You also mentioned uh, community and stuff. Is, is it mostly through Git, or is there uh, are there other resources that people can kind of access on the on the getting started side? And so we have we have a forum that's fairly active, about ten posts a day, um, and uh, um, people usually start. We encourage people to start out there because we have a good mix of senior people and, and beginners. Um, and uh, besides that, you know they. Uh, uh, between uh, everything else, uh, Git and um, and you know Twitter, email, and so forth, uh, I think I think we're we're doing okay. Great, that's great. Where do you where do you see all this stuff going in the future? I mean, uh, you mentioned the the um, the academic side of things. I mean, do you see it kind of just kind of cranking on math stuff, or f- where 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 would be the ultimate? The ultimate new application is that quadcopter, or are there other things out there that people might be that might tickle people's brains into using this thing. So yeah, so we, we we worked very hard on the on the parallel programming side for uh, for the last year, um, and and actually that that is the place where most of the work has been done so far from the community, and it makes sense. It's the um, kind of the plumbing layer and the infrastructure layer, and so we've had people work on tools and um, uh, and frameworks, things like OpenMP, MPI, OpenCL, Erlang. Um, Python wrappers, uh, even a basic for parallel. Um, so that, you know, there's about 12 different pro... Basic. Yeah. <laughs> Which is very cool. Um, there, so there's about 12 different programming <laughs> frameworks that have grown up organically from a community that we had nothing to do with, really, except support them. Um, but uh, so that, that part, I would say, you can give definitely give a grade A, um, where... Where we now need to um, put our focus is uh, two application areas, and it's uh, it's imaging we talked about, so the the drones and the robotics, um, and there um, we we just need to make sure we have the hardware and drivers in place to enable that, kind of like what the the Raspberry Pi did with the um, the camera board, um, and um, um, and then the second yep, one is uh, exactly. software defined radio. Ah, the realm of of the Osmans of the world, Mike Osman and the and Jared and all them, all the all the people that like that stuff. Yeah, that's a uh, that's some crazy stuff they do. And, and it's all a lot of that's done with the the low level. It it seems like they're DVI chips, right? So the the digital video thing. So they have the big multipliers. It seems like this would only only accelerate that ability. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have many people who think that the parallel is is the perfect or a very good SDR platform. In terms of the, what it provides, I mean, and it's a combo of uh, the ARM, the Zinc, like the FPGA, and the Epiphany. Uh, so the, coming back to the heterogeneous computing, you need all three to to make a good platform. Um, not everybody wants to do an SDR in FPGA logic. It's just it's just hard. I mean, some some of these algorithms are, are tricky, and and you'd rather write them in Damn. C code than in Verilog because you can iterate that much faster. And yeah, especially people coming from the DSP, the the DSP processor world, right, versus the FPGA side of things, where there are tools that can convert that stuff, but that's more like high level math trying to convert it into to uh, logic. That that's a that's a different different beast altogether. And and yet at the same time, you definitely need the FPGA for all the connectivity, hooking up to the RFICs. Doing some of the front end filtering, uh, so I, I think it's a it's a it's a great fit to have all three working on that, uh, you know, jointly yeah, as a good solution. Um, Are you actually working on a a new, more powerful core, or are you going to run with your current? Uh, what is it, the Epiphany three? Or if you no, you've done the four, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, so we did the, we did the four uh, as a shuttle uh, at twenty eight nanometer. So that was the sixty four core. Um, unfortunately. It would have cost three million dollars to get that into production. Um, so you can do a shuttle, uh, shuttle basically meaning low volume production Ouch. at uh, at a couple hundred thousand dollars uh, to go into volume production. You you have to you know put in another three or so. Um, so we we didn't have that. 
Um, and when we ran the Kickstarter campaign, we were hopeful that, you know, we, we put $3 million as a reach goal to get in there, but uh, we didn't get it. And so we, and we couldn't raise the money on the side to enable that either. Are you still looking to raise money on the side, venture capital and angels and all that sort of jazz? Have you got any outside investment at the moment? Oh, yeah. No, definitely. We So we, um, we had, um, when we ran into trouble with the Kickstarter campaign, it was a, uh, it was a, a Swedish company, a big base station company named Ericsson, and um, and a VC that saved us. So we we would have we would have gone we would have gone bankrupt if it wasn't for them. That's stupid. I mean, that's good they were there, uh, but that uh, yeah, that's always rough because then it means you <laughs> kind of give up some control as well, right? Yeah, it's um, you know, it, it is what it is, as I say in Boston, right? <laughs> um, so. Uh, it's, <laughs> I mean, if you if you need to if 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 you need millions of dollars to reach a product and an ecosystem, it's hard to do that just bootstrapping. Um, so um, uh, so in and in this case, um, with uh, between the uh, the parallel production and the chip design and the um, um, and, and the, even the Epiphany three production, um, there was just no I, I didn't see any way around it. Um, so yeah, so that that's that's what we're taking in to date, and uh, um, right now, um, you know, the, the parallel e- ecosystem is growing nicely, um, and I think it's really going to take off once we have the uh, the SDR and the imaging um, solutions, so that people can have everything they need to to really go after those ones. I, I mean, one of the things we found is that a board by itself without the daughter cards is still a zero score, right? It's, it's a it's an and operation. You need all right. the things in place to make a successful sale, um, and uh, and it, we started off with a with a parallel board, thinking that there's going to be a daughter card ecosystem, um, or around this, like there has been for the Arduino or the Beagle board or or the Raspberry Pi. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but um, you def you need a big uh, customer base to make that happen. You know, again, you, I kind of had to follow the Absolutely. money. Absolutely, I, I think you are on. I think you are on the winner there by trying to focus on like imaging or SDR or something like that, and you know, getting a real building a successful product around a core market like that. Agree. Yeah. What about like a, a neural processing? I mean, that seems like something that I always see for parallel, like neural networks and stuff like that, and artificial intelligence is there any is there anything in the community about that right now or is there interest in that in the research sector uh there is there is definitely interest from from many different camps in the research part um but it's research it's not necessarily gonna sell a lot of boards so you, you know you might sell ah true um, yep 16 or yep. 20 to one university um or, or they might even put uh build their, their own board with a bunch of epiphany chips on it but um it's it's yeah it until that becomes a usable application by others or a programmable platform by others it it's kind of a dead end um so you know where as compared to let's say an imaging where you say how many people have bought drones out there and how many people would want those drones to be um be able to avoid the telephone pole around in front of them so they don't have to you know buy a new 700 hundred dollar drone <laughs> right <laughs> it'll be worth um, the the hundred dollar board or whatever so do you have any major uh, competitors coming up with uh, similar uh, cores like this that can be used in supercomputer applications, or are you guys still ahead of the curve there? So in the supercomputing space, it's mostly the big guys. Um, it's NVIDIA, it's uh, Xilinx, Altera, it's Intel, it's ARM, um, and... Uh, you know, those are all formidable opponents. Um, in the um, and uh, you know, in terms of startups, um, the you know one of the problems we had in raising more money is that there are very few investors investing in chip companies because the returns have been really poor in the last fifteen years. And yes. So, you know, everyone who's been burned once is going to think twice before they invest again, and some people have been burned. Literally hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, you look at things like Calcsada or Tabula. Between those two companies, there's three hundred million dollars wasted. Whoa. Ouch! <laughs> um, and uh, it's you know, 
<laughs> it's it, not not any fault of the of the engineers on those in those companies. Of course, it just happened. Yeah. But uh, for the investors, it, it was their money, right? I don't envy you at all <laughs> getting into the semiconductor space. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's it's all right. I mean, it's it's what I do. I'm a, I'm a chip guy. I've always been. Wouldn't for me to do anything else. <laughs> you'll you'll pry this chip from my cold dead hands. You know. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh goodness, I love it. Is it is it is it tough to ke- uh, to catch the attention of like the 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 chip fabs these days? I mean, or is that is that pretty standard? You know, interfacing with. Uh, a TSMC or someone similar like that. I mean, is it hard for that kind of stuff? Uh, it's it's not easy. They would definitely prefer you to uh, to work ah. through a an aggregator. You know, there are design firms or design servers that they want you to work through. Um, and a lot of times, the problem is that everybody wants their margin. And so, when I started going through some of these design firms, the prices they wanted was completely out of my league. And so, especially when I was working on my own. I mean, some of some of the quotes were, you know, million dollars for a test chip. Oof, dang! And uh, 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 and and I was like, well, I <laughs> that's great, but I I can't afford that, so I'll do. I guess I'll do myself. So I um I got a a, a good deal on EDA tools, um, um, um kind of a special startup deal at, um that then you know once we raised funding became a normal EDA tool, but um. Uh, with those tools and, and hard work, we were able to do a chip on less than two hundred thousand dollars. What what everybody else quoted a million dollars. Wow. So so it, it's and, and so and then I worked directly with the foundry. But I, I also got lucky in that I got into a second kind of a not TSMC. I couldn't get into TSMC at the time, but I got into a you know one rung below that was hungry for business and um, and so and once we once I was in, I was able to keep moving with that foundry as they buy global foundries and then as they move forward um because i it's yeah it's it's not easy but it's possible um it, it depends on which vendor and the timing yeah well that's I, that's uh, it's a crazy experience but i think it's you know it sounds like it sounds like for these kind of things like you mentioned with the 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 calculations per watt it's like that's where it really that's where it really is needed that's where the that's where the rubber hits the road kind of thing Right, so are you guys set for the future? You are like, or are you sort of running out of cash? Do you need another investment round? You got another Kickstarter going? Considering that you love Kickstarter so much, what's There's what's definitely the future? No more what's the next step? There's definitely more no more Kickstarter <laughs> in the future. Um, we uh, we've uh, we've stayed pretty lean, small team, so uh, we're we're close to break even. Which is a good thing, uh, yeah. and uh, 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 yeah, um, and uh, you know there there are some things working right now that are looking pretty good um, on the commercial side, and uh, so yeah, all in all, things are pretty good. Awesome. Um, it's uh, you know I would say that you know almost there might be some great things towards the end of this year. I'm cautiously optimistic. <laughs> um, oh, excellent, excellent. Well, we, yeah, we'll definitely keep an eye out for that. We're never allowed to ask the really, the really fun questions of what is it, but, you know, I'm sure that it's, it's going to be great. <laughs> right, yeah, no. <laughs> Whatever okay. it will we be. We can have you. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I would hate to see another startup semiconductor company fail, you know, because they're just like, yeah, it's just a bit depressing to see. So we wish you all the success. Oh, thank you. No, oh, thank you. I, I uh, it's um, it's been a wild ride, but uh, we're, we're gonna we're gonna stick it out another couple of years at least. And I highly recommend that people. Uh, I was reading some of the the blog posts you had before. Like, this is a great one. The introduction to semiconductor economics. I think that's awesome. Just to have, uh, you know, a kind of a breakdown of what's actually in the costs based around it. You know, like that's just a lot of people don't ever do that. I mean, my, me and Dave included. We're just just we never really experienced that. And it's so easy to think, oh, well, I could buy a chip for three dollars. Why? Why do I have to care about the, you know, why? What? Are, what? Did, what did it take to get it here? So, um, that that's really cool to to see that stuff, even though it seems a bit painful. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think I actually might do a, a new one on Kickstarter economics. 
um, just so that uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that, that people just understand what, what what goes into running a Kickstarter campaign. Um, yeah, uh, definitely, that would be very well received. I suspect. Well, that's great. Well, Andreas, thank you so much for uh, for being on the show. We really do appreciate hearing about this stuff. And I think that you know a lot of people in our audience are you know they're they're the people that are down in the trenches, kind of working on this stuff. I think I think that this the, par- the parallel could be a really good fit for for some of the new vision application stuff like that. No, it, it was really I, I, it was a great call. I uh, it was fun. Excellent. And where can people uh, uh, follow you? Contact you? Are you on Twitter? Are you hiring? Um, we are not. No. Uh, unfortunately, uh, but uh, uh, I mean, if you can, we the the one thing that I'm always open to are are collaborations or partnerships, um, and uh, if uh, yeah, we um, I'm always open to uh, to queries uh, either by email or, or Twitter. Okay, awesome. excellent. And we will um, uh, put a link to the parallel board down below because at 99 bucks, it's pretty much a bargain. You get the zinc processor with the arm and the FPGA and the parallel uh, boy and the um, and the uh, supercomputer chip as well. Fantastic. Yeah. 16 core or beautiful, and you can start developing apps. Yeah. Well, thanks again for being on. We really do appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Dave. Okay, talk to you soon. No worries, mate. Catch you next time.